Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hope you can hear me. Please uh, pop your location into the comments so I get an idea of where everyone's from. We'll just let this uh, go for a minute or two and uh, wait for some notifications to head out and for people to get in. So, yeah, so that's kind of the rule. Where are you? Who are you? Where are you from? And then um, that helps me look at my list and uh, mention plants that might be suitable to your area. So, yeah, do that. Be good. If you're a regular, say hi. Um, and also, I'm, I'm willing to uh, take comments and suggestions about the music but when I don't have a guest it's nicer to have a little bit of music um, I hope you're oh, oh someone's someone's nicked off um, so Facebook YouTube just let me know where you where you're from if you wouldn't like We'll just let these notifications filter through and see who comes in. Are you enjoying the dumpster fire that is happening on Twitter? That's pretty interesting. Just give it about a minute and a half more and maybe two minutes before we actually get started. I hope you can hear me. Welcome. Facebook seems to be the place to be this morning. Um, do me a favour in the comments. Let me know where you're located so I can go through my... When I go through my list and try and pull out plants that will be more suited to where you are. Morning YouTube. Uh, if you've been here before, you know that just at the start I'll uh, ramble on a little bit, let the notifications get out there amongst the, uh, the different platforms. Let people put their coffee down or finish toasting their toast, whatever it may be. Let's just, uh, oh, we're here. This music is called Daydreaming. I wonder whether I should go back to Feeding the Ducks. I did like Feeding the Ducks. I'll just set that one go going. Oh, that's, that's a far more laid back feel. I like that one. Not seeing any of you tell me where you're from. You gotta help me, help me with the list. All right, another, just a few more seconds before I'll uh, pop the countdown on and we will get, um, we'll get into it. Nerds, plant enthusiasts, habitat gardening fans. In case you're new here, I'm Grant. I host the Bird Emergency podcast and these streams that happen on the various platforms. So I'll just let you get a good view of the bird. 
There we are, the white cheeked honey eater on, uh, I think that's a Banksia speciosa. No, it's not. Uh, I'll remember what that is uh, shortly. Uh, da, 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 da. We're going to talk about plants that flower in winter. Why is that important, you might ask. Oh, and I have to have my glasses on because I have a, I have a list in my in my book and if I if I don't have my glasses on I won't be able to read it um, first I know I've said this a million times before but I would like you to let me know where you're from so that as I go through my list I can perhaps pick out some plants that might be good in your particular region uh, obviously if you're in the north of Australia they're going to be quite different to uh, the plants that are in the extreme southern end of Australia. And again, if you're in a sandy soil area, it's going to be quite different to if you're up in the mountains. So um, that music's a little bit loud, isn't it? Let me just let me just bring that down a little bit. I am digging the groove though. G'day Adam, uh, we are. Adam's in Geelong, welcome aboard Adam, I haven't, um, don't think you've popped into any of the, uh, any of the streams before, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, Adam, I just, I wonder, did you catch the show we did um, with Janine Duffy from the Koala Clancy Foundation? We talked about a lot of plants there, specifically in that area uh, west of west of Geelong, no, east of Geelong, northeast of Geelong, that they've been working on. Uh, okay, I'm just I'm just checking. I've got uh, links from. Uh, Sorry, I thought Naomi was regular listener and participant. I thought she was trying to tell me she couldn't get into the Facebook chat. But no, that was just uh, just a comment about something else. Okay. Seems a logical place to start with one of the most uh, numerous plant genuses in Australia. Uh, there's one for every every situation and that's going to be the acacias you probably won't be surprised um, that there's going to be a number of acacias a number of grevilleas a number of eucalyptus that feature um, and we'll we'll just uh, plod through um, okay and this will work much better too if there's questions and answers so if you've got a spot in your garden or on your porch or on your balcony or something that you want a plant for we'll get into it otherwise just reading a list is going to be pretty boring but um let's let's talk about a handful of acacias well it's probably more than a handful it's probably about probably about 30 but i'll just draw attention to a few um, and what I try to do is mention plants that should be fairly available in the trade, like as in at your local nursery. But bear in mind that since I was actively involved in, uh, in the nursery trade, um, and I'll happily discuss my experience if you would like, um, I am a horticulturist, by the way. I did go through Burnley. Uh, here in Melbourne, um, but with with COVID, with the labour issues that we've had with people not being able to go to work, and some, I don't think retail nurseries were were ever called um, essential services. 
there's still staff shortages. And if there were staff shortages two years ago, that interrupts the pipeline for those lovely plants that you see in beautiful condition in a, in a six inch or 15 centimetre uh, or 20 centimetre pots in the nursery now. So some things might not be available, but I'm going to give you a whole bunch of names that you can scribble down and don't worry, there will be a document that you can get hold of uh, probably tomorrow that you can download that will have all of these on it. Um, so let's just go through a few of the acacias and I'll talk about a few that I think are particularly good. Starting with acacias beginning with uh, A, a dunker or a dunker. Um, not easy to find, but nice and floriferous. Acacia amblygona, but it's a cultivar and you'll usually see it tagged Ostraflora winter gold. That one is very good. Uh, for something a bit larger and in the northern and more inland areas, you can get the mulga, which is Acacia anura. Now it's quite a large um, shrub or small tree, uh, flowers in winter but really important for insects. That's what most of these acacias are really good for, is that they bring in insects and invertebrates into the garden and also give you colour. And when we talk about some of the larger ones, put my, I've got my wanky uh, design hat on, they give you structure in, in the garden and I'm, I'm more than happy to go off topic and talk about any of those things. That all depends on what your situations are. And look, uh, if, you, if you actually have difficult spots and you want some advice, there's a way we can, we can get that stuff on as well. Um, let me just say hello to the newcomers. Hello, newcomers. I will put my... Um, uh, Put this one up again to just let let me know where you where you're from if you wouldn't mind and we can get to it now a really common acacia we're in the acacias so this i'm not sure how long we're going to go but there's a long list acacia baileyana or the cootamundra wattle uh medium medium tree some some varieties are a small shrub i generally don't like to recommend this this one because it is in many places an environmental weed but it has value if it's not on your council's environmental weed list you need to check that but there's a variety that has purplish new foliage and it's a really good a really good addition in a mixed planting as a background plant in a, a in a mixed bed but they also have great seed pots so after the flowering is finished so after they've been flowering in the winter and springtime you'll have that seed uh, twisted seed pod which is or twisty not really tight twist um, and obviously then you've got the seed eating birds will enjoy it and a benefit of all the acacias are that they fix nitrogen in the soil so they will improve in many cases um, a garden bed over time and the larger ones are quite long lived but not you know you're not going to lose anything if you want to change them after uh, five or ten years as long as you're succession planting you will have something to fill the gap all right Beckleri, um, Bidentata, one of my favourites coming up, Boormanii. It's a small, uh, small to medium shrub, but it's fairly upright in in nature, um, in habit, I should have said. It works really, really well uh, to give you upright form in a mixed planting where you might, you know, sh shrubs are often more rounded. Um, 
Chinchilensis, better for northern uh, parts of the country and inland. Uh, Conferta, Coriacea, another one of my favourites, Decurrens, uh, Dramundii, Elongata, Farinosa, Flexifolia. Flexifolia is another beauty with a nice upright form. Um, Genistifolia, Floribunda, Itiophila, or Itiophila, which is the Flinders Ranges wattle, really common in the trade. Um, really valuable for a bl bluey green foliage, a rounded habitat, habit. Um, excellent plant. Um, Linigera, that's Acacia Linigera. Uh, Leptus, oh, Lassia carpa. Leptospermoides. Uh, Longifolia. Uh, now, a big one. Here's a big one. Um, Acacia melanoxalon, melanoxalon, which is the black wattle. Um, I get very bored reading the list. Tell me where you're at, where you're at, so I can get an idea. Come on. Um, oh, only a few more acacias. Um, oh, oh, gunny eye. Let's. Did I did I mention that? Imbricata. Imbricata is a ripper. I think that'll do for acacias. Yeah. If you want a couple of large trees. These ones are very good, um, but some people will hate them if they've got fruit bats in the area, probably. Now, these are Acminas, or they may have been moved into Syzygium, uh, depending on where your labels are from. Again, too, I'm not trying to, to use strictly up-to-date, correct scientific names. I'm going by what you're most likely to find on a label in a nursery. So Acmena australis and Acmena smithii. These are both lily pillies. Um, you may see them as Eugenia or you may see them as Syzygium, but Acmena australis and Acmena smithii are most likely to be the labels that you will see in the nursery trade. They're, they're quite large. Acmena australis is smaller, maybe two to three metres. Um, Acmena smithii, much taller, generally. But they they flower, and they're in the Myrtaceae family, so they've got that, you know, five petals, um, a bit like a tea tree kind of flower. But they're followed by fruits, so they're really valuable for all of the um, seed-eating birds, um, the fruit eating birds obviously, uh, once the seeds have dropped you'll see all the seed eaters come in, but they provide a good store of food for brush tongued uh, mammals, so honey possums, um, all that, and obviously, well maybe not obviously, insects love them, and their foliage is quite dense, so they they encourage a lot of insects. So, um, quite out of fashion nowadays, but really, really useful, especially if you have a fairly large block or a semi-rural uh, property and you need upright form structure to pull the garden together. And remember, tall, even if you're in a small a situation where you have a fairly small garden. If you look around and you can't see tall trees anywhere in your neighbourhood, it might be good for you to put something in which is three to four metres at least because birds like to get up high so that they can see what's around them. Um, so that they have an important function. Okay, a couple of shrubs. Uh, now, these are shrubs that are related to the grevilleas quite closely. Adenanthus, that genus is really good. Um, woolly bush, you might know 
know them as, uh, Barbigera, Obervata, and Sericea are all flowering in the winter period. Some early, some late. Um, excellent plants. Uh, I should explain too, I'm not I'm just putting visuals up for all of them is just insane. You never remember them. That's why I'm going to give you the document that you can uh, pop onto the website and grab tomorrow. Agonis, Agonis parviceps, um, a really good, really good plant for attracting insects and invertebrates, uh, butterflies particularly like Agonis. So it's pretty much a West Australian genus. Most of them do quite well in in the east. Um, once they're established, they're quite hardy to to frost. If any of you know my first seen and heard each morning, that's Shadow, who generally accompanies me on the, on the walk early in the morning. Um, now, this one here, which is an environmental weed in some parts of the uh, of the country, but a really useful plant for insects, uh, a habit, nice habitat plant, and also for brush-tongued nectar, nectar feeding birds. Elbizia or Elbitsia lofantha. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty familiar in in uh, northern parts of the country. It's it's available and it. Does it does adapt quite well? I mean, I've seen quite a few of them in in Melbourne, but it grows really, really well. But can be a problem with environmental weeds as an environmental weed, uh, even though it's a native plant. Uh, do check your local council list, make sure, and and your state government list to make sure it's not. A declared weed species. Um, a bunch of kangaroo paws. They're, there's not too many that, that are winter flowering reliably, but here's four of them. Uh, three of them are species. One of them is a cultivar. Let's start with the cultivar. Bush baby. Quite, quite a small one, as it might... Uh, uh, that name might indicate but the species manglesii is the red and green kangaroo paw which is the west australian uh, floral emblem and it's what's what are we talking about? three three and a half feet perhaps um tall meter meter and a bit um anagosanthus rufus these are all anagosanthus that's the um genus for the kangaroo paws. Rufus, it's a red and it's a tall one. Uh, can These can suffer from what's called ink spot disease, so the leaves can often look tacky, but the plants generally can, can hang around quite well. Uh, a really severe prune after flowering is finished will help you to get nice new spiffy looking foliage. So Manglesii and Rufus are both quite tall varieties. Viridus is the green kangaroo paw, far less showy in its um, uh, when compared to the other two, but really, really reliable. I suggest if you're not planting them into sandy soils in Western Australia, which is where they're from, I, I would encourage you to try them in containers in native um, mix, always top quality uh, grade, and native plant food only on these, or something like um, severely diluted maxi crop or, or Charlie Carp, fish emulsion, that kind of thing. Never overdo it with these plants. And uh, plant them in a raised, in a rose mound, if possible. Astartia is the next genus we're going to talk about. Um, Astartia winter pink is really common in the trade. 
flowers in winter, funnily enough. Uh, it's, it's really reliable. And the other one that I would recommend in that genus would be uh, Fascicularis. Now there's a couple of, uh, in the next genus, I, these plants have little berries, I think. I think, I think their common name is generally, you'll find them as um, beard heasts, I think. Astrolima ciliatum, Astrolima conostephoides, stephioides, um, and humissum, uh, humifusum, humifusum. They're, they're small, they're a bit prickly, but they have nice little flowers, again, insect attracting generally with a little berry that, that follows. So again, um, a lot of the birds will make use of that. Ostromertus dulcis, you'll see that everywhere in the trade. Fantastic plant. Bacchausia myrtifolia, Beckia ramosissima. Excellent plants. Let's have a little a little rest from the uh, from the list there. Now come on, folks. Uh, Adam's told us where he's from. I I really would like to know where where the rest of you are from at the moment. We're going to go into Banksias in a moment. Um, but first, birds in backyards. So That's a fantastic resource run by BirdLife Australia where you can always get good information about attracting birds into your garden to do it safely and you're going to see a lot more of that kind of stuff from me on the Habitat Gardening channel which kicks off, this is kind of an introduction to it, but it kicks off on in January. Okay. Okay, let's get into Banksias. You probably, well, if you've ever had any uh, interaction with my stuff before, you probably know that I love Banksias. So let me let me go through. It's quite a big list, but I'm going to go through them, and then um, I'll draw your attention to some which I think are really excellent. Alphabetically, too, I'm going through them. Banksia a Mueller, Banksia. Ashbii, which I think might be this. Um, Banksia bowery, bowery, Banksia brownii, Banksia candoliana, candoliana, uh, beautiful. Banksia canii, not really common, but well worth looking out for. Banksia coccinea, that is the scarlet Banksia that has the red flowers at the terminal end, uh, like the plant behind me. Um, so the terminal is at the end of the branch. Um, really common in the florist trade now. Uh, it has this really nice, uh, I was going to say wiry. It's not quite wiry, but most of the forms that you'll see have quite long branches with terminal flowers on the edge. Hard, hard pruning will keep it close, much more compact, uh, but I like the way they, I like the way it shoots out the different branches. Um, has a reputation for being difficult. I used to grow it really well in East Gippsland, so it wasn't the temperatures that were an issue. Um, really susceptible to too much phosphorus, so you must use you must use native plant feed, and pretty much on everything I'm talking about, just use native plant feed. Slow release if possible. Um, Banksia erisifolia, or ericifolia, as a lot of people will call it. The small varieties, like you've probably seen birthday candles, um, honey pots, all of those kind of things. Um, oh no, that's some, um, no, beg your pardon. Uh, giant candles is the erisifolia, one I'm thinking of. Um, but you've got, uh, I've already mentioned birthday candles, 
uh, Carnarvon Gold honey pots. There's Spinulosa, Banksia Spinulosa uh, selections. They're really good. I did mention Banksia Giant Candles. Uh, if you can find that, you will not be disappointed. Bear in mind that I think if you can, try and find a species rather than an improved cultivar, uh, just for the whole genetic diversity kind of thing out there. If people only buy the cultivars or the selections, well then they become what the trade focuses on, they become what's propagated, and then a lot of the... Let, they're not less desirable, but the less popular plants disappear from the trade, and that's not good for biodiversity. Uh, also, let me let me also inter interject. These are things that I know you should be able to find in a good native nursery. If your only option, or a good local nursery, if your only option is Bunnings, you might be really limited into what you can get. Hello, Cocky. Um, but do try and search out Indigenous Nursery or your council may run a nursery and they may they may have a you know good list of local local plants. You can't beat local. Banksia hookeriana, Banksia integrifolia, one of the all st all stars. Banksia integrifolia and Banksia serrata, extremely common out in the trade, really, really reliable. There are small forms of both, but if you want a big tree, Banksia serrata is a big tree. Um, you can find upright or fastigia forms of Banksia integrifolia. You can find ground cover forms of both Banksia integrifolia and Banksia Row, uh, serrata. So just see what your nursery has got. Uh, Banksia laricina is a really decorative, unusual Banksia. Um, we'll, you'll only find that in a specialist native plant nursery, I would guess. Banksia marginata and eastern suburbs, uh, uh, eastern suburbs, eastern Australian. Uh, species, as are Integrifolia and Serrata, really reliable, um, lots of forms, flowers of many colours through the grade of almost greeny, yellow and almost into orange, um, lots of um, structure forms, quite, quite small, open branchy, tight and compact um, and, and ground cover forms. Banksia media, Banksia media, really, really, really great plant. Reliable in the East Coast. Banksia menziesii, reliable on the East Coast as well. Uh, Banksia quercifolia, oak leaf Banksia, well worth a try. Um, Banksia roba, a swamp Banksia with a bluish green flower, flower bud stage and then opens up into a greeny yellow flower. Um, one of my favourites, one of my favourites. Banksia speciosa, Banksia sphericarpa, funnily enough, like a sphere. Um, that's a beauty and I mentioned the two Banksia spinulosa forms that are reliable in winter birthday candles, and uh, carnivan gold, carnivan gold. Okay. Let me press on. Let me press on. Baronias. I've mentioned baronias a number of times in earlier streams. Um, three that are flowering mostly in winter. Baronia filifolia, baronia inornata, and Baronia, this you should be able to find in just about any nursery. Eastern, uh, uh, really reliable in Eastern Australia. Baronia Mulleri Sunset Serenade, 
Just remember Sunset Serenade. You'll find that all over the place. Um, you may have, you may know a plant called the Swan River Pea, uh, Brachysema lanceolatum. Well, it's not normally flowering in in the winter, but it's a close member of the genus Brachysema sericium is, and it's a far more understated plant. It's a smaller plant generally, but the nectar feeders will enjoy it. And again, it's it will it's a good habitat plant for insects and invertebrates. Um, I've only got one calistamin on the list because most of the calistamins flower in the spring and summer, but a winter flowering one, calistamin peliodosis. So look out for that one. Um, ah, I've got a colitris in here too. Um, the colitris are a native conifer. Cypress pine is their uh, common name. Colitris macleana. Um, the flowers are nothing to write home about, but insects and invertebrates love them, but they do have a cone. Uh, uh, woody as it matures, but you'll see seed, eat, seed eating parrots particularly get into them while they're young and forming. So worth a, a go. Um, I'll do casuarinas next. Now these are casuarinas, not aloe casuarinas generally. Equisetifolia is the generally the sort of Queensland coastal uh, it's where it's naturally found uh, of the casuarinas or she oaks but it's quite reliable a fair way down I've seen several in Melbourne doing well really nice foliage um, they are they have male and female plants in the casuarinas so different f looking flowers um, but again Really, beetles particularly, uh, beetles and other invertebrates, and well, actually, they're probably vertebrate. No, they're invertebrates. Uh, really like them. And Casuarina glauca is another one that has flowers in winter, and then you have the 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 cones forming. So again, at the back end of winter, um, something for the for the parrots to get into. Um, cassias, you may know cassias, um, uh, nem nemophila, let's, let's just leave it at the one. Now, pea flowered plants, pea flowered plants, boy, there's quite a lot I'm going to have to get, going. I'm going to have to move a bit faster. Corozema is a really bright pea flower uh, in most cases you might know it it's a, it this is a small plant it's a foreground plant in the garden or it's ideal for rockeries and containers corozema cordatum c-o-r-d-a-t-u-m and also aviculare but cordatum corozema cordatum you're far more likely to find in the trade. Um, Conostylus. Billy Buttons, do you know? Conostylus, uh, Biliana and Conostylus candy cans. Um, they're pretty... Conostylus candy cans you can generally find in a good nursery where they good selection of native plants. Uh, we're going into Corias now. Do you, uh, Corias are a, they're related to Baronias, uh, but they have a bell flower. Really popular with all of the honey eaters. Um, really, generally really reliable plants, um, mostly Eastern States plants, a lot of them are very frost hardy, 
So if you're in a cold climate, an elevated climate, couriers are really reliable. Now, one, two, three, four. Now there's a dozen of them here. So um, Backhouseyana, fairly large um, shrub as couriers go. Bowerlinii, which is also common name, chef cap Coria has a, um, that one, again, quite a large one, is really reliable, particularly in climates like Melbourne. Calicina, smaller. Dusky Bells, that's the one you're most likely to find in the trade, along with Coria pulchella. Dusky Bells can be a small to medium shrub. Pulchella is generally a very small shrub, you know, 60 centimetres max. Uh, a number of different flowering forms, um, but they're in all the colours in terms of pink through to, through to red, um, pale pink. Um, dusky bells, red and green, reddish. Uh, Coria reflexa, really common species, really really variable. Again, red and green, red, green, different flower types. Uh, there's also a variety of reflexa, which is called variety Numelara folia. Um, has a bit, it's a bit furry, um, bronzy, russet, uh, new growth. Um, greeny, pale, pale green, yellowy flowers. Uh, again, really reliable. That's a medium, uh, a medium shrub. Coria glabra, Coria lorenziana, a couple of um, cultivars or selections that you'll find in the train trade. Manii, Marion's marvel. That finishes off Coria's. Um, parrot beak bush, Crotillaria cunning hammy eye. Well, it's a small tree, um, very, very, very popular. No questions yet? No comments? Where are you from? Let's have a look. Um, Facebook and Twitch. Oh, hello, Twitch. You must have dropped in new. That's good. Dampiera or Dampira, uh, which are generally blue flowered, um, herbaceous. They're not actually herbaceous, but they look herbaceous y. Um, Coronata heterosea or heterosea, depending on who you meet at the nursery, and uh, Lineara. So blue, bluey flowered. Um, this one is common in the trade, Darwinia citriodora. You may find, if you, particularly if you're in Western Australia, you may find other Darwinias that are flowering in in winter. I didn't list any of them because just uh, they're just not common in the trade, even though they're excellent plants and they're and they're reliable if you can get them established. Uh, reliable. Do like mul a lot of mulching. That's one thing I would mention for them. Um, let's go down to Dodenia or a hot bush. Now, hot bushes are generally flowering in spring, summer, um, but Dodenia hum humifusa flowers in the uh, in the winter and develops hops. You know, uh, spring, summer gives the seed eaters uh, something to munch on a bit later on. Now, I'm, I'm, li I'm listing these next couple as dryandras, but there's been a review of dryandras and banksias. Proper uh, name for these is now banksia, but you'll still see them in the trade as usually listed as dryandras, but just make a note of that, that 
you may find them in the Banksia section. So always check out both. Dryandra nivea, Dryandra primorsa, and Dryandra speciosa. Now they'll have to have been renamed when they go into the Banksia uh, category because there's already a primorsa and a speciosa in Banksia. So, yeah. I don't, know what I, I don't know how I can help you out with that much more. Um, Apacris, which are the native heaths. They're not heaths, but they are called native heaths. Apacris impressa flowers reliably with so many forms from white through pink through um, dark pink almost to red. Um, small, generally upright, sometimes a wiry, twiggy form. Uh, the flowering uh, nectar feeding birds love them and excellent for insects and invertebrates. Great habitat plants. Great habitat plants. Uh, one of the other things with the Pacris, the Pacris impressa as well, the they're so variable over their range and lots of forms are really good in wet or not not always wet but periodically or regularly inundate, inundated soils um, will perform in fairly heavy soils through to sandy soils great plant the Pacris impressa Victoria's floral emblem uh, a Pacris Reclinata is another one to look out for. Um, but a Pacris impressa you should be able to find in southeast Australia very easily. And I'm pretty sure we'll have hit the trade in Western Australia. If you're in Western Australia, let me know. I'm pretty sure the Pacris impressa is in the trade in Tassie. Uh, if you're in America or something like that, sorry, I can't really help you yet. I'm going to get people from those parts of the world on to talk about them. Um, Eremophila is a genus with a sort of a tubular flower, really popular with nectar feeding birds, really showy in the garden. Sometimes the foliage uh, is a feature on its own and a number of those flower in winter. Eremophila, and their, their um, emu bush, they're often known as. Eremophila bignotiflora, big flower. Um, Latrobii, maculata, those three. Um, sometimes you have to buy Eremophilas as a grafted specimen, which can make them quite expensive, but... They're generally reliable on the East Coast if it's not too humid. Um, worth, worth a try. A beautiful feature plant. Um, yeah. I, I, I like them. I like them a lot. Uh, now I'm going to here with a genus name that may you may find it changed. Eriostomin is what these plants were known for a long, long time. We'll have a break to it in a minute before we get through the eucalyptus because there's a bunch of eucalyptus. But Eriostomin and Gustafolius, but look for the subspecies Montanus, sometimes just mentioned in on labels as Eriostomin Montanus. Eriostomin buxifolius, Eriostomin myoparoides, which is really common in the trade, and then one that is slightly less common, uh, varicosis. Oh, I've dropped my earpiece. Uh, varicosis, and it often has, it will, does have a double flowered form, so you can look for that one, double petaled form. Um, really pretty can be found in white flowers as well as pink. 
The Ariostomans uh, are related to Baronians, which are also related to Citrus, and they have the other um, feature. don't really know if it's an advantage, but when you brush against their foliage, you do get uh, a, a volatile oil released. Uh, some people like it, some people don't. Some people are um, a bit irritated by it. Sensitive skin can be irritated by it. So if you have someone who is uh, in the family or friends who visit regularly, who, or if you're in uh, managing a space that has pathways, excuse me, um, don't plant those right next to a path if you have people who are easily irritated in the skin uh, portion of their body. Portion of their body, my goodness. Um, yeah, Ariostomans, so they, they like it. Well, the, the main thing with growing them is they like a, what we term as a cool root run. They don't like to, they don't like their root zone to dry out and they don't like it to get um, like the temperature of their root zone to fluctuate too much. So they need to be well mulched. Uh, a trick I always like to, when I'm using them is to find if you've got big stones or old pavers, um, lay them on top of the, on top of the, uh, the ground when you plant your eriostomans and then mulch over them because they're a moderator for temperature. They'll absorb heat um, and they will uh, release it slowly. So, yeah, good. Eucalyptus. Let's, uh, let's get into some eucalyptus. Uh, there are there literally literally are probably a hundred or two I could have been included here, but uh, there's a mixture here of tall, small. So again, use the comments if you want one for a particular spot. Let me know. But I am just going to go through some of the really common ones and then go back to some of the rarer ones. One of my favourites, which can be a small to medium tree but it's a very open and weeping form eucalyptus casea or caesia depending on who who will try and sell it to you but silver princess is the uh the selection name uh flowers winter spring beautiful plant uh eucalyptus calii oh eucalyptus uh, Burdettiana, uh, Eucalyptus cephalocarpa, big plant, beautiful trunk, Eucalyptus citriodora, lemon scented gum. And actually, let's mention the other one, which is great for that. Um, where are we? Uh, where are we? Where are we? Yeah, there we are. Eucalyptus maculata, spotted gum, and for another big one, uh, Eucalyptus cideroxalan and the the rosea variety, the pink flowered one. Beautiful. Insects love it. Flowering. Uh, the flower attracted birds, honey eaters and lorikeets will not love it. Um, but it does come with a sort of white and uh, yellow flower forms as well but most commonly you'll find it in the trade as cideroxalan rosea also is the iron bark it's got the black fissured bark on it on the mature tree but they are quite quite large um, another one with bark as a feature as well as flowering uh, in winter is eucalyptus hemostoma which is the scribbly gum uh, really great in the Canberra region, the Highlands and, and whatnot. Um, a small tree, Eucalyptus dives or dives, but the selection called Little Honey is a small, a sort of a dwarf tree, 
profuse flowering, uh, white, lemony, um, and as I, as it's known, little honey, it, profu it, it produces a lot of nectar. Uh, so the, the birds will love it. And again, the insects will really love it. A um, couple of mel melly forms, so smaller forms uh, of eucalypts. Eucalyptus cruziana, cruise with a K. Eucalyptus laymanii, the dwarf variety, uh, which is bushy yate, used to be commonly known as. Uh, another of the yates, Eucalyptus mega cornuta. Um, Eucalyptus, Eucalyptus patchophila, uh, Eucalyptus polybractea, that's sort of got a bluish foliage and a white, white flower. Really, Eucalyptus uh, preziana, bell-fruited melly. Eucalyptus rodantha, the rose melly. Um, they're small, again, uh, really really nice beautiful specimen plants but also good in a mixed planting a large bed um a medium tree here eucalyptus leucoxylon subspecies megalocarpa um sometimes see that in the trade as ghoulwood gem uh that's a beauty uh really reliable in the southeast um variety from kangaroo island is really is really good some of the larger plants in the good for the northern areas of the country, uh, Eucalyptus miniata, uh, Eucalyptus tereticornis, that's the forest red gum, great around Brisbane and, and up to the mid, uh, mid north coast, uh, mid, mid to central uh, coast in, in Queensland. Uh, Eucalyptus miniata is a uh, commonly known as Darwin woolly butt. Um, so again, a fairly big tree, structure tree, same with the forest red gum. Let's have a look. Um, Eucalyptus wood wardii, medium, sort of large shrub, small tree, yellow flowers, whitey new foliage, grey whitey, um, interesting plant. Uh, I think we've gone through enough of those. I'm going to mention two figs, Ficus or Ficus. Now, one of these is a really big tree, Port Jackson fig, which is Ficus or Ficus rubiginosa, but flowers in the winter and then has the little fruits, um, a boon for animals and insects and Ficus benjamina which is more often known as a house plant that's but they do grow into a big tree outside um, and you will find that in a number of places or oh, you won't be sorry to know that we're getting towards the back end now I could have I could have rattled off I don't know, maybe a hundred or so grevilleas, probably. But I've picked out a few that are, again, commonly, commonly available. But again, with the whole lockdowns and interruptions to the trade, some of them may not be that easy to find. But we'll have we'll have a little break after the after the grevilleas. What about this? Alpina, small, red and uh, yellow and orange flower, really reliable, available in many different forms. It's a Victorian uh, species. Great. Again, why are we going through those? They all flower in winter, right? I think I'll just go through this list and then maybe talk about a few of them in, in general. So, Acanthifolia and Arenaria a great species to plant on their own. Uh, particularly are an area, if you can find it, one of my favorites. Now there's uh, a couple of these are trade names. 
cultivars. Ostraflora Canterbury Gold and Ostraflora Jubilee, worth searching out. Banksia Bowerai, a beauty. One of my favourites, if you can find it, a really good performer in eastern, southeastern Australia, Boongala Spinebill. Uh, one from the Sydney region, Grevillea buxifolia, Grevillea calii, Grevillea chrysophia, gold, yellowy, golden yellow flowers. Um, lovely. One of the old cultivars, selections, but great performer, Clearview David. Another one that's a good performer, a selection. Actually, let's go through a few of the selections. Crosby Morrison, Dargan Hill, Hookeriana. You may see it listed as Hookerana. Uh, sometimes it's listed as a species, but its origin is unclear. But red toothbrush flowers, big shrub, really reliable. Um, Pink Lady, Pink Pearl, Perinda Elegance, Perinda Firebird. Um, good. If you can find them, get hold of them. Uh, going back to some of these species, Chrysmifolia, Dealsiana, one of my particular favourites, Jeff Cottii, Johnsonii is a showy flower, um, but again, reliable. Juniperina, prickly, great habitat shrub. Um, Lanigera, smaller. Levangelacea, greyy green flower um, with a red and white, back to sort of pink and white flower. Mounding, really great shrub. Similar to the way Grevillea rosemarina folia, old fashioned but really reliable. Rosemarina folia, get hold of that if you can. Um, Longifolia and Longistyla. Um, yeah. Should both be out and available. Uh, my particular favourite, Grevillea cherisei, very understated shrub, great for hedging, a dense plant, but not prickly, but has bluey green flowers. So you don't really see the flowers, but the birds love them. Very nectar rich uh, flowers, apparently. Uh, the next one you will sometimes see out there in the trade as Grevillea dimorpha but it's actually Grevillea speciosa, subspecies Dimorpha. Um, and I think it's one, it's one of the parents of Grevillea, of, of Perinda firebird. So, and also Perinda firebird sometimes is just labelled as firebird. Um, so keep an eye out for those. And a ground cover, which I really like, is Grevillea thelmaniana, subspecies Thelmaniana, and that's got the greyish foliage. It's not the bright green foliage. There's a couple of varieties of Thelmaniana, um, but they're, that's where I'm going to leave it with Grevilleas. There are literally heaps and heaps. And indeed, we might do just a Grevillea show. Um, over January, I'm going to do a lot of things like this, so you know, look out for your notifications. Oh, yeah, I've got to tell you that, don't I? Uh, subscribe, follow, or like, ring the bell, or whatever. Um, and I'll, I'll, I generally do my live streams on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. But let's let's have a look who's winning, who's winning today. Uh, Facebook and Twitch. Oh, hello, Suho. Thanks for the like. You're you're new. Hello. It's nice to have new ones here. Uh, so, yeah, maybe I will be doing more on Facebook since there's more of you here. Um, appreciate the like, too. Thank you very much. Don't forget, questions, comments. That's what that's what I'm here for. This is your one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, we've got a comment. Okay. Hi, Sue. Very nice. Uh, what's that you've got in your... Um, What's that plant you've got there? I can't see the, the flowers very, very small. 
Uh, looks like maybe it's a succulent, is it? Let me let me know. Let me know. You're up. you're early for Perth. What is it? Only only eight a.m. in Perth. I did wonder about whether I was doing this too early because of Perth time, but uh, welcome. Nice to nice to meet you. So uh, have I got that right too? Is it, it Sue is for, properly addressing you first, or is it Ho Sue? Um, let me know. School me. Learn me. Ah. Let me get comfortable again, sitting in one spot for the whole time. Another plant that has had a rename. Uh, really, really good for insects. Thanks, Sue. Um, Sue's just confirming I've got it right. Thank you, Sue. Um, Gushinasha macrantha. Grey foliage. Um, quite an open, small shrub, uh, but with a purple... Mauve to purple bell flower. Uh, it's a beautiful little plant. Uh, just imagine if I prepared overheads for all of these. I would have. I would. I would. It would have taken me a week. But it's very common in the trade. When I first got into horticulture, it was really rare to find. But it's such a good performer that you will probably be able to find it. Uh, Gushinosha. Macrantha, G U I. Again, if you if you didn't catch the start of the stream, I'm going to put all of these in a document that you can um, grab and download through the website, which is thebirdofenergy.com, uh, and I will have that up tomorrow, I would imagine. All right, let me just let me just have a cup a cup of coffee sip. We're getting into hakeas. Um, now, Sue, you might know hakeas, lots and lots of hakeas from Western Australia, but there's also a good uh, selection from the East Coast. And again, what I've picked is plants that are flowering in winter. Now, this one is a West Australian, the first one that I'm going to mention, hakea um, buculenta. Red Hot Pokers, you may see it as. So it's got uh, a, a long a long flower, uh, but quite um, uh, uh, long, just regular regular leaves, but nice ve veination. So it's an attractive plant on its own. Then it has the uh, red, red, red or dark pink, flower but the thing with hake is, is after the flower you get the uh, fruits and your cockatoos in the west like hake seeds so that's good um, another one which is like buculenta uh, one of my favorites hake multilineata a west australian again really really good um Hakea petiolaris, Hakea purpurea. What do you think purpurea might have? Purple flowers, you think? Yeah. A um, couple of East Coast ones now. I've mentioned before in other shows, but really reliable. Hakea sericea, great habitat plant. Spiky, white through to pink flowers, really prominent woody fruits, but they're flowering in winter. And Hakea suave islands, um, quite bushy, a bit similar in its habit, habitat or habit to Hakea lorena, which most people are probably familiar with as the pincushion Hakea, but suave islands just has like a, a sort of one or two or three single flowers in the axils, leaf axils. Not anywhere near as showy, um, but... The birds love it and the insects love it. And it's a good structure plant in a garden. Quite a large, large shrub, small tree. Um, and Hakea varicosa. You'll be pleased to know we're getting towards the end. I knew this would go so long, so I've only done sort of the first half of the uh, of the alphabet. But luckily, all the Grevilleas, Hakeas, 
um, Banksias, Eucalypts are all front-ended, so we've got most of them. Uh, Hibertia or Hibertia, depending on who you encounter in your local nursia, nursery or the Bunnings, if you happen to go to Bunnings. Now, Hibertia are yellow-flowered. They're all yellow-flowered. They're generally called guinea flowers in uh, as a common name. Uh, there's only a couple that flower in the winter and they're good small shrubs, rockery specimens, uh, container plants. Um, so Hibertia, my way of spelling, uh, of pronouncing it, Hibertia calicina, uh, C-A-L-Y-C-I-N-A, and Hibertia stricta. They're, they're plants for insects and invertebrates rather than plants for birds. Although they do, have, they do, um, I've seen pigeons and rosellas going after the, the seeds, um, but that's later in the, uh, uh, in the cycle. Uh, we mostly West Australian genus here, Hypercalama. H-Y-P-O-C-A-L-Y-M-M-A, Hypercalama, Angustifolium, Myrtifolium, and Xanthopetalum. Those three flower in the winter. Um, adaptable, reliable in the, in the east. I'm sure they're super reliable in the west. Now, Indigophora. Indigophora australis, widespread on the east coast. It's indi, indigo, might give you a, a, an idea that it has mauve or purple flowers. Um, they're, a, they're not a showy shrub. When they're not in flower, you put them in a mixed planting and you'll just forget they're there. But they pop when they're in flower. It's in winter and in a mixed planting, they will stand out. So highly recommended. Uh, another one from the Banksia grevillea slash Hakea kind of tribe, Isopogon formosus. Um, drumsticks, not that they're often known. Uh, coneflower in the, in the trade. Uh, Isopogon formosus, flowers winter and spring. Um, a couple of Canedias. Canedias are climbers, usually. Some Western, Western Australian ones, Eastern Australian ones. Two that flower in winter. Canedia microphylla and Canedia prorepens. Um, Canedias are excellent choices. I've used them as ground covers, you know, scrambling through uh, mixed plantings, uh, cascading down hills, uh, plant them near an ugly tree that's, you know, maybe senescing, dying. It'll cover that. Uh, hanging baskets, fantastic. Um, plant them in old pipes, plant them... Uh, uh, Ah, uh, look, yeah, good on you, Breadmon. <laughs> you can always rely on Twitch to come up with some really uh, interesting comments. That one's not making it. Um, and the last one I've got, Lambertia, or Lambertia, Lambertia erisifolia. That's the last one I'm going to talk about. Questions, comments, Q&A. This is your you've virtually got a one-on-one -on -one with a horticulturist who is big into native plants. So got a difficult spot, got a plant that the animals, the birds really love. Um, thinking of removing one, I don't know, anything you want to talk about. I've got to put this one on because I don't even know what you're talking about, but you can always rely on Twitch to give you something. Baz Bell me told me you're yeah, on the tins. 
Okay, well, I don't know. Do you mean on the tins as in we're drinking beer or on the tins because cans is something that headphones are called and you have confused tins with cans? Um, good on good on Baz, anyway. Good on you, Baz. Um, Twitch is always... Uh, Twitch, I love Twitch, but boy, it's weird. Um, so, I'm here at your service. Anything you want to know, Sue? Adam? Did you make it in, Naomi? I don't know. Let me know. Let me know. Actually, I will check my messages because sometimes I've got... People can't get in and... Um, Let me just check. Uh, oh, did you see the news of what the the number one album on on the Aria charts? Do you know what it was or what it is? It's the Frog album. The sounds of Australian frogs. That's been released and. They wanted it to get to number one for the Christmas album. Good on you. Um, shout out to Jody Rowley and the rest of the team, Frog ID and whatnot. Fantastic. What else will I tell you? Um, uh, I think that's what I wanted to tell you about that. Um, oh, I also wanted to bring your attention to, if you follow me on Twitter, I think we're in the last... How long? I have a poll, a Twitter poll up. Let me have a look. Yes, it's three hours still to go. And I've just asked the question, would you consider supporting crowdfunding for upgrading my equipment to produce the show? Now, I never would have even thought about crowdfunding until I got involved with promoting the tracking Australian painted snipes. Let me know with a, with a why or a no in the comments. Do you already know about tracking Australian painted snipe crowdfunding? Do you, do you know? Do you not know? There we are. Well, you can know now. Now, when I spoke to Matt Herring, who is behind this project and Matt had already done a crowdfunding uh, in the past about bitterns in rice cooperating with rice growers in the Riverina region of um, uh, southwest south central New South Wales well Matt got that going and that worked out so this time we he got this crowdfunding going together on on chuffed to track the painted snipe, Australian painted snipe, and there were only three, there's only about 340 of this bird left in Australia, and it's not very well understood at all. Um, would you like me to play the? Actually, we'll do this because I've got no plant questions at the moment, so um, I'm going to I'm going to play this video so you can understand what it's all about. And we'll talk about it a bit and how it's. Blooming fantastic. Some birds are sneaky, but there's this one bird that's so sneaky, it may as well be a flying ninja. The Australian painted snipe. And guess what? How many do you think there are left in the world? 10,000, 20,000? Are you sitting down? About 340. That's right, 340 is the latest estimate of how many painted snipe are left on planet Earth one of the rarest birds in the world. Even at key sites, they vanish for years at a time. Where are they? Where do they go? How is it that Google, Facebook, and my smartphone are better at tracking me than we are at knowing where the painted snipe are? Did you know we've never even recorded its call? And just look at it. It's beautiful, like Gustav Klimt. No, no, his artwork. We want to solve this mystery once and for all. To study painted snipe, we've got a dream team of experts. 
With your help, we'll be able to purchase the latest transmitters to track at least 12 painted snipe, uncover their mysteries, and begin saving the species. You'll be able to follow their journeys on a dedicated website with regular social media updates. There are even opportunities to sponsor a bird with naming rights, perhaps as a tribute to someone special. There are loads of other rewards too, from photographic prints to tours, and just that general warm feeling of helping a flying endangered ninja. Let's repaint the picture for this neglected species. Visit chuff.org slash project slash painted snipe. So, <clears throat> there we are. That's the project. Now, when I interviewed Matt with Holly Parsons for one of our Monday with Holly shows, um, which we did a few weeks ago, and when we did that, there were 170 people had contributed, and Matt's looking for $116,300. Now, he's just short of a hundred grand at the moment. So no matter what happens, they've got enough money now to do the bulk of the project, which is great. But since we since we spoke about it, which was only a week or so back, uh, and I put the podcast, <clears throat> rushed out an episode of the podcast, there was 170 supporters. Now there's 238 as of this morning. Uh, it's just amazing. It's just amazing. And look at some of the amounts. I love that someone donated $777 uh, yesterday. 200, 1,000, 1,000. But there's some amazing numbers in here. Um, 500, 1,000, another 200, 500, 4,900. Um, 2,000 there, a consulting firm, 2,000, another consulting firm, Nature Advisory, Maureen Christie, uh, Cash and Management Group, Gumbauer and Kerrang Ramsar Project, so that's on the border, New South Wales, Victoria, 2,000, Murray Darlin's Wetlands Group, 2,000. I mean, that's so cool. Um, a $20,000 uh, New South Wales Department of Planning and Environment. Um, so many friends of the show in this list, so that was that was great. So I just wanted to let you know about that. Um, if you haven't contributed, you might consider doing so. If I got my and I got my list here for the. Um, uh, I set up an easy link, so if you go to thebirdemergency.com slash painted snipe, that'll take you straight to the um, the crowdfunding page. Yeah, so there we are. So I only brought that up because I was I'm um, I'm thinking of I would like I would like to upgrade my tech for the show. Uh, if you don't know me well, if you haven't met me before, I try and get everything. I try and have everything is secondhand, reused, recycled. It's all part of my, you know, I just don't think we always need new stuff and we certainly don't need a lot of stuff. Uh, as I look around, apart from stands that I had to buy um, new and the cheapo lights that I bought, um, I bought the microphone new about five, six years ago now. Most of what I use, and actually most of what I own, is secondhand. But I'm on a secondhand laptop. Um, but I really need to upgrade my processing power if I'm to be able to keep producing as much stuff as I would like, because there's still hundreds and hundreds of bird conservationists and researchers and species to talk about. I really need to get a new, fast, high-capacity computer 
Uh, and next year, I plan to take the show on the road um, using my newfound camera video videography skills and not just be a talking head sitting in the Million Dollar Studio, but to be out and doing stuff in on location, taking bird nerd trivia and some photography Friday style workshops and things like that out. To do that, I really do need a a new um, a new laptop that is high end. I don't think. Well, yeah. So. I'm thinking of doing a crowdfunding and trying to raise a couple of thousand bucks. So nothing like 116,300. So if you're on the Twitter, um, just on my profile, at Bird Emergency, uh, you will find a poll, which has not got much longer to go. But I would love to, I would love to know whether you would consider, um, supporting me in some way through crowdfunding and then I might do it. Then I might do it. Okay, well, we're at the sort of stage. This is about the time I generally like to wind up, about an hour and a half. Is there anything else you would like to ask me or talk about? Is there any? Oh, I did want to show you something else too. This is totally, um, totally indulgent, but let me... Let me put this up because sometimes when you do um, when you do a show and you're not getting um, a lot of people a lot of um, sort of feedback, you sometimes just wonder whether you're shouting out into the void. Now I got this beautiful um, review. Let me make that full screen so you can see it. Now this came up the other day, and um, I'll tell you the story in a minute. So this is isn't this nice? I'll tell you what I really like about it. So it's a five star review, inspirational and entertaining nature podcast. Highly recommend this highly bit of a tautology there. Highly recommend this highly entertaining, informative, and thought provoking provoking podcast. The host genuinely cares about our natural environment and is particularly focused on the plight of our spectacular bird species within Australia and around the world. His guests are often personally investing to make a real and positive difference in many different and sometimes surprising ways. I find the current state um, in I find the current state insights and related practical and pragmatic suggestions inspirational and have made some changes in my own life as a result. Hoping that the podcast is successful in inspiring lots of people to get to better love our birds in particular and help make changes that leave a natural legacy for our children and their children. Great job, Grant. Me and thank you. So that's from someone called Chris, who I was going back and forward with with email. But what I really like is that um, he's recognised that the the academics and the, the researchers and the practical conservationists often have to give up a lot in terms of career prospects and, you know, financial recompense to do work that helps birds. And I love that he said that um, some of the suggestions that we've come up with on the show have made, he has made some changes in his own life as a result of that. And I have to tell you, my friends, that is why I do it. That is why I do it. So that people know and understand and get involved. So while I'm pushing the get involved stuff, do you see that? Actforbirds.org.au. That is a site um, that... BirdLife Australia have put out there, and it is a summary, really, of the kind of campaigns that are going on and the actions, things you can support to make a difference. So actforbirds.org.au, 
the Turn to Harbour petition is there. You can still donate for action against uh, the Turn to Harbour development on the shores of Mar uh, Morton Bay. But uh, the pesticides um, campaign always goes on to try and remove the really harmful pesticides that affect all of the bird, all of the birds, and other animals that eat, you know, pest, but pest species, mice and whatnot. So uh, do go and check that out and have a look. Um, probably one other thing I would like to let you know: the Bird Emergency Podcast, just the podcast, has just cracked its twenty-four thousand download. Twenty-four thousand. Um, that's not 24,000 people, but 24,000 downloads of a podcast about bird research and endangered birds. So, hey, if, you, if you're one of the listeners, uh, thanks so much. And I've just started posting in Twitter and Mastodon and a little bit on Instagram, going right back to the very earliest episodes, episode one, I've promoted yesterday with Steph Burrell and guess what when I put that up and episode two biggest individual day ever of the bird emergency uh, in terms of downloads so that's good so there we go I've done my um, self-congratulatory uh, Saturday morning waffle last chance anything else you might like to say um um, nice to meet you, Sue. Um, Sue and Adam, I haven't haven't had you in the chat before. That was great. Uh, Breadmon, I don't know what's going on. Um, ah, Adam, thanks. Uh, yep. Yeah, what what I have been doing, Adam, just to fill you in over this break. Over the sort of silly season, December, January, I will be live streaming at all sorts of different hours. And one of the things I'm going to do is replay really old ones just in the stream like this, but I'll be here so that if you want to have any questions or comments, I'll be able to interact with you as well. But it'll also be a bit of a learning experience for me to go back because, you know, Generally, what happens is you produce this stuff, you download it, you do, you, you edit it as quickly as you can to get it out. You do the artwork, you throw it out, and that's that. I never listen to them again, right? I just remember or look at the transcript and try to remember the the conversation. Uh, I don't know how bad I really was way back when I started, and I I recorded the first episode about um, uh, about two years before I actually got around to publishing it. Uh, so uh, let, let me ask both of you, uh, Adam and Sue, since you're jumping into the comments, because that's what we're here for. Are, are you listening to the podcast? Have you? Or you're both, I see you're both on Facebook. Do you get most of the content on Facebook? Because what I'm trying to do is... Um, you know, we've been going for so long. There's 82 proper episodes with a bunch of bonuses. So I don't know, there's 150, or what, probably about 130 episodes, episodes out there. Um, and, you know, I've got a list of people to speak to that's hundreds of people long. I've got a whole... I've got a whole folder of bird species that I would like to chase up and the difficulty is finding people who, finding people to talk to. But um, but what I'd like to know is, one, are you listening to the podcast? If not, are you checking out the YouTube or just finding the stuff on Facebook? And in... In January, I will actually be doing stuff like the plant stuff. I'll be simulcasting it, streaming it to both the bird emergency, but also to Habitat Gardening with Grant. 
and eventually all the plant stuff will go off into um, uh, habitat gardening. Um, what have we got? Uh, so not really a podcast person. Okay, so you like the live streams. Uh, look, I love Costa. Costa and Costa's been a good friend of the of the show. Been often pops into live stream chats and whatnot. So that's great. Uh, Sabrina Hahn. Now, plenty of people have told me about Sabrina Hahn. Let me, let me just look Sabrina Hahn up and find out where she's from. Excuse me while I do this. Hort with heart. Um, now, is, is Sabrina... Oh, she... Okay, so she's a Perth personality. Okay, and she's on local radio. ABC personality. On, okay. Okay, okay. Okay. So, is she now... I wonder if she's going to become the... Um, a Gardening Australia person. Okay. Uh, oh, yes, so she does tours and whatnot. Cool. Um, cool. Great. Thanks for bringing her to my attention. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm probably going to start doing some consulting and maybe some design as well. I don't, I don't want to get into the making it my number one thing because... I'm probably more interested, having worked in nurseries, had my own nursery, been through horticulture grad and all that stuff, worked in, I worked for Yates. So I've been right through the industry. I worked for Bunnings, uh, worked in retail nurseries, worked in production nurseries, as I said, had my own nursery. Um, I'm probably a bit more interested these days in protecting plants that are really rare uh, lots of them in Western Australia there's so many that you could lose I'd like to see people introduce them in at least into horticulture into home gardens get some popularity so that at least there's a chance of preserving them uh, and I'm really into the whole well habitat gardening the interactions with birds plants mammals, reptiles, invertebrates, um, and biodiversity as a whole and make she, making garden design less about, um, well, more about, uh, more about making design and spaces that humans create and manage to be friendlier to animals so here, here's a nice comment what have you what have we got here Adrian, uh, that is true uh adam i'll read i'll read this out just in case it goes up on on the pod feed uh Adam has said, and Adam's from Geelong, wasn't it, Adam? I've heard about the podcast but haven't had time to listen yet, although I've been meaning to watch some of the live streams to find out about it, and this one happened to be on the time I was able to watch live. Never enough hours in the day to catch up on all the content that is available. That is so true. That is so true. Um, it's very hard to keep up with what's what. Um... I'm br I break the formula a little bit. A lot of people, you know, one show a week or in the set time and all that. But I'm I'm trying to find people all over the world. And uh, when I'm doing Australian stuff, con and this content for the Habitat Gardening is really aimed at Australia. Although I will be getting people from Audubon and maybe RS... Um, RSP, RSPB, Royal Society for Protection of Birds, talking about what they recommend in terms of plants. So, um, but this time, I wondered whether this might actually be a little bit late for people who might be going to the nursery on a weekend, and this is who I want to get in this this time. 
So, Adam, tell me, and maybe Sue, because you're in Perth, is this a good time to talk about gardening a Saturday morning or would a Friday night be better for you? Um, Friday evening, uh, is it too late on a Sunday? I actually want to do a different kind of a show on a Sunday. I want to do a relaxed chit, chit chat about all kinds of conservation issues on on a Sunday and I want to be releasing other seabird stuff on late Saturday afternoon, Seabird Saturday. So this Saturday morning live stream seemed to be a convenient one for me. But tell me, what do you both think? Uh, Sue, you're in Perth. Is a Saturday morning a good time for you? And Adam, is a Saturday morning a good time for you or is an evening a better time? If you're preparing, the idea is that I do this to give you some ideas about what you might want to do on a on a weekend. Um, and, you know, I'll, I want to... Uh, here we go. So Sue's given us a comment. So Saturdays are a great idea, especially during the school holidays. Uh, yeah, great. Um, when I eventually come to Perth, Sue, so I, I will be trying to visit... Uh, that nursery. I think um, uh, I think Josh featured it once in um, in uh, Gardening Australia from memory. Um, yeah, so um, uh, you you probably haven't heard before. I'm I'm building a list of indig and specialist na native nurseries for around the country. It's still a fair way a fair way from being complete. Uh, but yeah, there's never enough time. One, there's never enough time to listen to everyone else's content, and there's some amazing people out there in the space. Um, so, even though my design skills are, are pretty good, I'm far less interested in you know beautiful water features and stuff like that. I'm only interested in how the birds or the lizards or the you know the antichinus or the betongs or whatever it can get access to water and also using water responsibly. Adam, Saturdays are okay. Weekdays are difficult. Yeah, well, weekdays, again, um, I mean, to give you an idea, Adam, just about everyone I interview for the bird, for the bird show, uh, they're employed by universities or other groups and they want to do an interview with me in their work time, right? So, um, so I gen and and now when I started the the show, I didn't stream it live. I recorded it using the same technology, the same platform, and then I would edit it and then release it. But now I just want to get the 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 double whammy because a lot of people will never hear the podcast, but they might catch it on YouTube. They might see it on Facebook. Or whatever. So now when I interview someone, I stream it live. And if people don't want to talk to me live and be streamed live, I don't talk to them. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm a bit like that now. Uh, because this takes a lot of time. And also, it's a big investment. Um, you know, It actually costs me a substantial amount of money to have the website, to do this have the technology for the streaming, the editing, the transcription, even though I only use AI transcriptions, I used to go through and check them. I used to pay people to do them. But when you look at the analytics for the number of people who uh, whoever go back and look at it, it just wasn't worth it. spending 60 bucks or something for per episode to do a beautiful transcript. Um, so, yeah, but I... But it takes me probably four times as long as it needs to to do all this stuff, but just simply because of the. Uh, how old is this laptop? I mean, this, this one is uh, uh, 2013. Early 2013 is this one, and this is my new laptop. Uh, do you want to uh, hang about? Hang about. Um, hang about. 
That's what I, that's what I mostly, that's what I produced most of the episodes of The Bird Emergency with for most of the time. And before that, a Windows 98 um, old HP, which weighed about twice as much of, as this, and this weighs about twice as much as the one that we're talking to now. So, yeah, I've, ne I've always, you know, tried to use secondhand material because I just don't believe in, I just don't believe in everyone needs a new thing. You know, my phone's secondhand, everything's secondhand. My monitors are secondhand. Um, but yeah, I, I need, I need a new laptop, especially if I'm going to go on the road and then I'll be having to deal with bad internet. <laughs> I don't want to have bad internet and a computer that can't handle the processing for the videos. It was one of the reasons why I haven't got around to um, cutting up all the live streams into smaller videos so that we've got five minute videos on YouTube that make it easy for people to consume. Um, anyway, anyway, that's a big waffle. Um, Adam, Sue, uh, whoever else, I don't know if Naomi's with us or, oh, we've still got someone on Twitch. Is that still, uh, say say hi if you're on Twitch and you've got something. Tell me what you're into. Um, Sue, Adam, give me an idea of the kind of content that you would like to see if I do more on Saturday, Saturday mornings. Um, and Adam, because I do know people do things like shift work and also there's... Uh, well, my audience is pretty well evenly split between Australia and the US um, and then India and Europe and whatnot. So there's there's people all over the place watching. So different times, obviously. I'm going to start replaying the streams, uh, but I won't always be able to be live in the stream with the replay. Um Tell me, to, to just tell me what you would like. What would you like to see over January? Uh, apart from me replaying the old stuff. And a lot of the old ones, the really old ones, that, are, that I didn't actually record video for them. I just, because I never, I never expected that I would be interested enough to do live streaming. But I really enjoy live, the live streams. It's an, it's an easy way to talk to you talk to you uh, obviously podcasts are a bit harder to get the feedback uh, and, uh, and as I well as, as I well know you can get uh, um, how many did I say did I say 24,000 I think it's 24,000 we just cracked um, and I started with you know three and one two three listens a day and now it's you know we've cracked we regularly get 200 listens a day now, and uh, that's great. And that's across all the episodes, not one. But now, um, now I know that I'm reaching people and I'm getting feedback from people. And when I approach someone for an interview now, they generally tell me that they've listened to the show or they're a fan of the show. So that uh, I never imagined it would be that. I always imagine there'd be like 20 or 30 complete bird nerds <laughs> listen, listening to the podcast. But yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, what else would I like to ask you? I, I do, I would like you to tell me what you would like, what you would like to hear, what kind of stuff. Um, I'm just check, checking if there's any new Space Karen news today. No, no new space carrying news this morning. Uh, okay, what have you told me, Sue? So? Okay, now let that's a good that's good. Integrating native ground cover and low shrubs around veggie beds is something I'm keen on. Now, does that mean, Sue, so, that when 
Does that mean they are ground covers that you need to walk on? Uh, are they ground covers that you want to use to suppress weeds? Um, yeah, th those kind of issues. Um, yeah, tell me that. I mean, ground covers are, are amazing. Um, when I was at Burnley, there was actually a trial running for, I think it was in conjunction, or I think it was a, the aim behind it was to try and find ground covers that councils could use to suppress weeds, but also they wouldn't be um, expensive to maintain. And they used to be tested with people running mowers over them, flail mowers, slashes. Uh, so yeah, there's some... There's some really good native ground covers that you can use for suppress suppression of weed, retaining retaining soil. Um, but then the the one of the main variables of whether you select them is whether they can handle foot traffic or not, and also foot traffic, pet traffic, you know, dogs running around, weighing on them. Um, Ah, cool. Okay, well, uh, Adam says he's more into the fauna than the flora. But will listen to whatever nature-based content that is available. Adam, that's a really good good point. I'm into the whole the whole thing, and you can't really take one away from the other. Um, you know, water usage, irrigation, how does how do animals and insects uh, with their relationship with with the flora, how does that fit into the whole, you know, pest species and all that? So, uh, yeah. So, not within the beds. Veggie beds are raised, okay. Uh, and grow bags, good. Uh, so, okay, okay. So, the natives would not be trodden on. More to encourage native bees and lizards. Not too many smaller native birds. Uh Highly urbanised, dominated by red water birds and the introduced rainbow lorikeets. Yes, rainbow lorikeets. Um, I'm actually trying to trying to get a program on the invasive nature of rainbow lorikeets and what's to be done. There also um, there's a, a pitch battle to keep them out of New Zealand as well. So so that and. I've recounted the story a lot on the show with different guests. When I was when I was young, a hundred million years ago, uh, when I was a kid, rainbow lorikeets were nowhere near as common as they are now. In and and they used to follow the flowering eucalypts up and down the coast. Uh, they used to arrive with the flowering eucalypts and they'd leave. But one of the things about the native plant um, bonanza in the late 60s, 70s, early 80s with people planting native plants meant that there was food all the year round for birds like the rainbow lorikeets, which means they've sort of changed their their natural pattern. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so I'm guessing you can just tell me with a yay or a nay, a yes or a no, a Y or an N, you'd probably like me to come up with a list of birds that will attract native insects into the garden? Just tell me. I'm thinking the answer will be yes. Uh, Adam, there's a lot of stuff in the archive about um, creating hollows and other opportunities too that you might be interested in. Uh, in the thing. I thought you might do that. Sue's given me a, a yes. Okay. Well, maybe Sue. Um, what are we at? Net? I've Would you like that to be on a Saturday, Sue, or a weekday or an evening if I went into that? Because the lucky point is I will produce it with you in mind. And if anyone else comes along for the ride, well, good on them. Uh, but you tell me when you would like to. You would like me to do that show. I'm going to write it down, whatever you tell me right now. Uh, do you want it to be a Saturday morning? And is this too early for Perth? Uh, 
like what's that if i do it at 10 that makes it 7 a.m perth time uh or would an evening be better uh okay sue has said saturdays is this time too early for you sue or is it good i can be earlier if you want um can do it after first seen and heard <laughs> uh, so insect attractors Mornings are good. Okay, well, if this isn't too early, that's what we're going to do. Okay, well, we're um, running up to the two hours. I really did not think that this would go for for two hours uh, this morning. Uh, and we only got to the first half of the alphabet too, but I figured that was more than enough. Um, feel free, if you are watching in the future, listening in the future, or for those with us now, and thanks for the... Um, Thanks for the love, the likes, and love on Facebook. Um, just, you can always suggest something you would like me to cover. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm really into the whole, uh, all the, the conflicts that arise, the problems that arrive in, arise in gardening, in maintaining gardens, um, yeah, and, and I'll never take the approach at all. It's great, we'll go down to the nursery and buy this stuff and then not think about what it's going to be like in four or five years' time um, because that's all part of having a garden. Gardens are never finished. They continue to evolve. Food, you know, a production food garden, herb garden, coexisting with a native garden that you want to um, bring uh, animals, birds in. Uh, these are all things that need to be considered and often aren't. And irrigation. Let's get on to irrigation another day too. So, Sue, so feel free. Um, Adam, anyone else? I know Naomi often I saw she was sending me some messages earlier on. Uh, you can message me on Facebook. I'm often a bit slow to get onto that. Instagram, DM me. Or just tag me in comments, uh, Twitter, Mastodon, Twitch, all the places. Okay, gang, um, bird nerds, plant lovers, gardening heads, habitat gardeners, however you want to refer to yourself, I'm Grant. This has been the Bird Emergency and Habitat Gardening with Grant because I'm going to pop it up there as well. Uh, enjoy your weekend. See ya. <laughs>